you, Benito. Thank you for taking us to that journey of uh, the pieces and the models, how they were uh, driven from Europe to the, the new Spain or the Nueva Granada. Thank you so much. The next talk, um, the values of the Hispanic cultural tradition as illustrated in the visual arts is by Marcus Burke. Marcus Burke is a senior curator of the Hispanic Society of America, has served on the faculties of Yale University, Columbia University, and New York University's Institute of Fine Arts, among many others. He has previously worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Meadows Museum, and has contributed to exhibitions at many, many other institutions. Marcus, you have taught us so much in our Hispanic knowledge. We have all enjoyed your, your knowledge and your interpretation interpretations of Sorolla and else. So thank you so much for being again in San Diego and welcome to the stage. She has the power. She has the power. It's always good to see the assembled thrill seekers. My remarks today are a sampling of a much larger meditation on Hispanic culture from which I have selected only a few topics in keeping with the themes of this symposium and the works of the exhibition. Now, before I go any further, I need to warn you that with a view towards the application to our social needs today, I will be emphasizing mostly positive elements in the story. While there are dark sides to the history of Hispanic culture, my purpose, in the immortal words of the late Johnny Mercer, is to accentuate the positive because I believe there are many values in the Hispanic traditions that we sorely need to cultivate in a complicated, dangerous, and highly internationalized world. I'm showing you here a map drawn in 1526 by Juan Vespucci, Amerigo Vespucci's nephew, showing the world as it was known at the time and documenting the Spanish and Portuguese international empires at the beginning of their three centuries of power. In 1476, 50 years before the map was painted, the Iberian Peninsula was a multi-ethnic, multiracial, multilinguistic, and multi-religious region, although beginning with the fall of Granada in 1492, the religious diversity began to be radically diminished. Even today, there are five official legal languages used on the peninsula. In the Middle Ages, there were more than 10. The map shows what happened in those intervening 50 years. The Spanish and the Portuguese, who would have the same king from 1581 to 1640, had exploded out over the world, beginning their literally globe-circling commercial and political empires. The map shows a midpoint in the initial process. Magellan's crew had circumnavigated the world. Uh, the Molucca Islands and Philippines, is this working? Ah, Molucca Islands and Philippines, are on the map twice because, Natch, the world is round. You are also looking at the beginnings of modern science in many ways as humans began to plot out their world in empirically manageable ways. However, you will note a number of things missing from the map. Literally, terra incognita. For example, there is no Peru because Pissarro wouldn't get there for another six years. And there is no California either because neither Penelope Cruz nor Javier Bardem had arrived. <laughs> Now let's jump ahead for, <laughs> sorry. Uh, now let's jump ahead 400 years to Joaquin Sorolla's murals called Vision of Spain, a series painted between 1911 and 1919. It's at the Hispanic Society in New York. It shows the ethnic costumes and culture that the artists and our founder feared were disappearing at the time. It's a regionalist vision of Spain celebrating local, cultural, and multi-ethnic elements. I suppose you have often heard about all the things Hispanic culture has brought to North America. I, I mean, have you ever shopped on Rodeo Drive? <laughs> but here's some other elements. For example, ladies. Ladies. Where? Here. Ladies. When you wear a pair of flaring pants over boots like these bull herders uh, from Andalusia and maybe a straight-brimmed hat to go with them, do you call them gaucho pants? like the Argentine cowboys inherited from their Andalusian ancestors? And what about mariachis? Do you know where the mariachi uniform comes from? From the dress of really high-class Mexican cowboys, especially from the region around Leon, who are called charros. The man on the horse 
is also a charro, a charro salmantino. Just stretch his hat out, and there you have it. And what about this other man on the horse? Riding in, well, not Dodge City. He's riding into La Lagartera near Toledo. Howdy, partner. A Spanish cowboy. Do you think we may be looking at types derived from an international cattle herding culture spread by the Spanish? However, I want to focus on a different set of values. A group of cultural values derived from the almost complete identity of Iberian culture after 1500 and its promulgation internationally with the Roman Catholic religion, especially the period of the Catholic reform in the late 15th through the 17th centuries that came to its first climax at the Council of Trent, which met from 1545 to 1563. You may have heard the period called the Tridentine period after the Latin name for Trent, or the Counter-Reformation because of the competition with the Protestants. I'm showing you, I will be showing you, I'm showing you one of the most important results of the Catholic reform and the Counter-Reformation, the creation of the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, under the inspiration of its founder, Ignatius de Loyola. Projected onto Portugal, onto Spain and its European dominions, and onto new worlds in the context of a conquering and evangelizing effort, the reformed Catholic mindset resulted in a uniformity of religious doctrine which nevertheless exhibited extensive cultural blending, a certain amount of religious syncretism, and the expression of local cultural and artistic values. The international Iberian-influenced world also shows the inheritance of the Spanish and Portuguese languages, many common customs, common ways of organizing the church year, and therefore the secular year as well, common understanding of social institutions such as family life, a surprisingly egalitarian manifestation of the worth of the individual and common devotions, such as the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her Immaculate Conception, shown here in this wonderful image uh, by Juan Carreño de Miranda, which was sent to Mexico in 1682 in the lifetime of the artist. And notice the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe on the other side, perhaps the very one in the current exhibition, which is also an immaculate image. The theology of St. Ignatius had another aspect to it. How many of you have read the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius? Oh my! Oh, I'm preaching to the converted. That's great. <laughs> uh, on the route to focusing the believer's mind on higher things, Ignatius begins with a highly naturalistic exercise focusing on the reality of this world, this being present. Notice, I'm sorry, it's so small. Notice how the hands in the book jump out of the frame, is part of a larger swing towards naturalism, which would come to distinguish the art of the uh, 17th century, particularly its early decades, as, for example, in Velazquez's The Maid, which shows the Christ and the pilgrims at the Supper of Emmaus in the background. Bible history is set into the here and now, and with a humble protagonist in the foreground going about her work. You can also see it in the still life compositions of the era, such as San Diego's own picture by Juan Sanchez Cotan from around 1602, or Francisco de Zerberan's Oranges and Lemons of 1633. Cotan would become a monk, and scholars such as uh, Roberto Longhi see Zerberan's image as relating to the type of arrangement you might see on an altar. The current exhibition also shows the sense of naturalism applied to religious art, such as these pictures by Zerberan working in Seville on the left. Gabriele, I too could not get a um, post-conservation image of this, and it, it looks a lot nicer in the galleries, by the way. And on the right, Francisco de Ribalta, his Valencian contemporary. The idea is to make the devotions of the saint and the resulting visions as real to the viewer as they were to the saint himself, thus inspiring a similar devotion as the Council of Trent wanted. This naturalism carried over into purely secular subjects, such as his self-portrait that Bartolome Murillo painted for his children. I, I think the comparison is obvious here. The sobriety of Spanish portraiture, at least of the menfolk is truly notable in Spanish painting. Uh, 
In this portrait of the Spanish King Philip II of about 1575-80 by Sofonisba Anguisciola, a woman artist, please remember, the only thing telling you Philip is the king is the tiny little image of a golden ram on the simple cord around his neck. Now, what does this mean? No, not that he shopped at Brooks Brothers. It is the Toisson d'Or, the order of a golden fleece, the highest chivalric order in Europe. King Philip might as well be a wealthy English Puritan, except for the rosary he's fingering. He certainly was a puritanical Catholic, the leader of the Counter-Reformation internationally. The point is the focus on the individual, not on the office. I have a personal story relating to this absence of social indicators. Once in the Madrid of the 1970s, I was walking down the Calle de Serrano when I came upon a woman of a certain age dressed in a very handsome tweed suit decorated with a brooch bearing an orange stone, her hair carefully coiffed, her mien reserved and graceful. I recognized her and she me, and we exchanged courteous pleasantries, as the Spanish often do, before each of us had to go off to appointments. Frankly, I could not for the life of me remember who she was, only that she was someone in authority, a duchess perhaps, whose family collecting history I had studied. It was only a few days later that the answer popped into my skull. She was the head waitress and service manager of the dining room in a scholarly residence where I had lived the year before. <laughs> now, now, what does all this prove? That a stupid American can't tell a duchess from a waitress? Well, perhaps, but more importantly, it, it points up an aspect of Spanish culture in which a waitress might well bear herself with the nobility of a duchess and in any case expect the same courtesy from a younger man that he would pay to a duchess. Here are two more examples of paintings underscoring the value of the individual. On the left is Velázquez's famous portrait of Juan de Pareja, his slave and studio assistant, whom he freed in Rome around 1650, at the same time the portrait was painted. On the right is Giuseppe de Ribera's clubfoot boy, an image of a handicapped beggar. The boy carries a piece of paper, over here, inscribed with Latin that means either, for the love of God, give me alms, or give me alms, if you want to obtain the love of God. The latter interpretation falls squarely within Tridentine Reformed Catholic theology. But in any case, the image clearly presents the beggar in a monumental way, seen from below, looming up over the viewer, silhouetted against the sky, his crutch slung across his shoulder like a soldier's arquebus or pike, a jaunty fellow. The portrait of Juan de Pareja is said to have been painted as a warm-up to Velázquez's equally realistic portrait of Pope Innocent X. I love the anecdote, which ought to be true even if it was invented, that, <laughs> that the Pope, upon seeing the portrait, said, troppo vero, it's all too true. <laughs> now what do you suppose Juan de Pareja's right hand is resting on? Any guesses? What does a man wear over there if he's right-handed? A sword. Well, he seems to be resting his hand on an unseen sword hilt, which in real life he almost certainly would not have done because only gentlemen could carry swords. That is, in spite of his frayed elbow, uh, Juan de Pareja is posed as a gentleman, a confrontation of two different understandings of social class. Certainly, when Velazquez exhibited the picture, at the Guild of St. Luke, the Artist Guild's uh, outdoor art show at the Pantheon in Rome, the picture caused a sensation and Velazquez was instantly famous. Pareja would go on to become a master painter in his own right, and here is the evidence, a, a painting from the Rangling Museum in the exhibition of the flight into Egypt. Later he would uh, go on to paint even bigger and more uh, uh, accomplished monumental canvases and have a studio. Another aspect of this value placed on the individual is the Hispanic attitude towards mestizaje, que Don Benito uh, so uh, clearly uh, told you about. I have to say I disagree completely with Tom Kaufman. I like the term for a number of reasons in terms of what it says as a cultural metaphor. I think metaphors are very powerful. I hate the English word miscegenation. 
Sounds like a racing boat. Uh, it's really so ugly sounding, and I prefer to use the Spanish mestizaje, or in Spain, mestizaje, instead. The multi-ethnic, multiracial history of Spain and Portugal before 1492 virtually assured that mestizaje would be the norm for the Iberian empires, and certainly this was the case in the Spanish vice royalties. Even as we speak, there is a Count Duke of Montezuma enjoying his evening merienda or cocktail in Madrid. He is a direct descendant of Montezuma II, the emperor of the Aztecs. Almost all of the important noble tribal leaders were accepted into the peerage of Spain. Well, while it's true that Pocahontas married Sir John Rolfe and became Lady Rolfe, her father, Powhatan, was never created Duke of Chesapeake. This points out one of the most important differences between Spanish and English colonialism, the policy of blending with indigenous cultures among the Spanish and the ethnic cleansing of the British. Here you see a work, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to change. Here you see a work by Juan Rodriguez Juarez from the first series of 12 Las Castas Mexicanas that he produced around 1716 to 20. In effect, Rodriguez Juarez took previous ethnic portraiture and turned it into one of the most representative art forms of the later colonial period, the series of Mexican racial mixtures. In this case, a mestizo tobacco merchant of mixed European indigenous descent has uh, uh, married a woman who can only be described, to judge from her incredibly luxurious, apparently silk, huipil, the costume she's wearing, uh, as an indigenous princess. The similar work in the exhibition uh, shows the same kind of silk huipil. Notice the frieze-like arrangement of figures silhouetted, there's that word again, monumentally against the background. In the exhibition, you will see examples from uh, the Costa series created by Rodriguez Juarez, including this image uh, at the bottom of a, a man who's of mostly European descent, but some indigenous descent, marrying a Spanish woman, woman with their child being considered Spanish. This social consciousness uh, continues into the 19th and 20th centuries, as in this extraordinary portrait from about 1843 of a young working man from the east coast of Mexico, uh, clearly of African descent, possibly a fruit vendor or a domestic worker bringing fruit to the table. There is in the image itself not even a hint of racial stereotyping or prejudice. I also want to call your attention to a work in the exhibition depicting a saint of African descent, this spectacular sculpture of St. Benedict of Palermo of around 1734. Notice the naturalism includes a very strong, dynamic, psychological realism as the saint witnesses to his faith and encourages his hearers to greater devotion. The dramatic naturalism finds a parallel in the cinema, as this close-up of Sidney Poitier from the Blackboard Jungle demonstrates. Notice especially the creases on the side of the nose as, as the face is tensed. The members of all the orders were called upon, especially in the New World, to perform social ministries, to witness to the gospel and the ethical demands of the faith, and to take what are known as prophetic stances, calling on those in power to show justice, especially to the lower classes, exploited indigenous laborers, slaves brought from Africa. Uh, the Jesuit St. Peter Claver offers an example. And of course, themes of social justice uh, continue in Spanish art into the 20th century. Another aspect of prophecy is that, of course, prophesying telling the future. One element in the art of great masters, including Spanish and Latin American artists, is their ability to create prophetic images. In two very large pictures by uh, Francisco Goya of 1814, called the 2nd and 3rd of May, you see the latter here, uh, Francisco Goya celebrated the common people of Madrid rising up against a relatively technologized French army. Um, and they're inevitably destroyed by that same faceless, automaton-like force. The mechanical, almost robot French soldiers shoot the Spanish patriots, including an obvious Christ figure, in the middle, illuminated by the light of the lantern. Light, which should be liberating, is made an instrument of repression. The picture pretty much sums up the experience of hundreds of millions of victims in the ensuing 200 years not to mention the spiritual and civic toll and the general dehumanization of society. 
In his equally large picture, Guernica of 1937, Pablo Picasso protested the bombing of a Basque village in April of that year. How many of you have read John Hersey's Hiroshima? Oh, some. Well, that's your homework for this week. Uh, I'm not kidding. Uh, among the extraordinary things the Japanese citizens of Hiroshima mentioned to Hersey was they, they could not remember hearing anything. They remembered the blinding light, as Goya's and especially Picasso's pictures predict. Getting back to the Jesuits, I'd like to mention briefly one other aspect of their socio-political engagement, uh, the so-called Reducciones Jesuitas, the Jesuit reductions, which were a social political experiment in the 17th and 18th century, in which the Jesuits created a, a, a sort of a, a, a little empire within the empire, rather independent of imperial authorities in Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, here is an example from Bolivia, the Jesuit mission of the conception, which gives you some idea of both the simplicity and the richness of the cultural context. You also have to imagine a highly developed musical and even theatrical culture in these spaces. Some of the missions had quite substantial buildings, such as São Miguel das Missões uh, in Brazil, and there were the locales of linguistic and um, uh, historical studies. At the end, there was a considerable betrayal by the European powers, resisted in some cases by armed revolt, led occasionally by the Jesuits themselves, which has been subjected to the Romantic Hollywood treatment, as, as you may have seen. It's Robert De Niro jumping the ramparts. Um, I might say, however, that the first ever Jesuit pope, an Argentinian, no less, Pope Francis, has certainly brought socio-political concerns to the papacy in the spirit of his Jesuit missionary predecessors. I tell my graduate students that no matter what the question is in Latin American colonial culture before 1767, the answer probably involves Jesuits. <laughs> Finally, I want to turn to an aspect of Hispanic culture, at least before about 1820, that may surprise you. You're probably accustomed to thinking of Hispanic culture in terms of machismo and militarism. You know, the man on the horse, the strong man, the macho fellow on the street. It's a common stereotype. In fact, again, before about 1820, Hispanic culture was um, just the opposite. Feminism was an extremely important element. Okay, are there, uh, I tell you what, uh, near, near, near you. raise your hand. Give us your, your, your last name, Neria. Um, Leva Casals. Leva Casals. Uh, who, who was Casals? It was her mother's name. Ooh, your mother's name. Here's a culture that takes care to, pre to preserve the mother's name. And in the 15th through 18th century, it also provided women with extraordinary social rights and protection. In fact, in contradistinction to countries such as France and England, women, and women could and did have full rights of inheritance. And in the case of unmarried women, widows, many noble women, and re women religious, they functioned with civil rights in society. I'm showing you here an anonymous portrait of Philip II and his children around 1585. It's at the Hispanic Society. The two princesses, dripping with huge diamonds and pearls, you might want to note, are leading their little half-brother, the future Philip III. <laughs> and I bet he loved it. You guys got any two-year-olds around the house? Oh, well. Um, I digress. The woman on the right is the Infanta, Spanish for princess, Isabella Clara Eugenia, Philip's favorite daughter and his state secretary and essentially co-ruler at the end of his life. She was given the Spanish Netherlands by her father and she went there uh, to rule them in 1601. She was the leader of the Peace Party in Europe, patron of Peter Paul Rubens, and one of the most extraordinary persons of her age. She also knew how to dress for success. <laughs> The jewels she wore made reference to her late father and her brother, King Philip III of Spain, the two most powerful rulers in the world at the time, and to her own sovereignty. 
Like the Infanta governess, Isabella, leaders of women's religious groups also commanded numerous followers and very large economic units. St. Teresa of Avila is depicted in this statue from San Antonio in the exhibition. I mean, San Antonio Museum, it was made elsewhere, um, is considered a doctor of the church. You see, she's holding a book and has founded several daughter convents while Velazquez's Mother Geronima de la Fuente is shown setting off to missionize the new world. Yeah, it's almost about there. Um, in Mexico from the early 1700s, women of Basque descent supported the Colegio de las Vizcaínas, a secondary school offering what was then higher education to women. It still is a prep school for women today. Roxana, did you go to Vizcaínas? No. Oh, yeah. <coughs> she said, I wish. Um, in the late 17th century, the poetess, playwright, intellectual, and convent leader, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, defended her right to express social and theological opinions in a clearly feminist way. She fought off a bishop who was trying to silence her. Both contemporary depictions of Sor Juana and this posthumous portrait by Miguel Cabrera in the exhibition from around 1750 show her in her library of theological, literary, and scientific books in precisely the same way that almost 100 years before, this portrait of a high-ranking male cleric had previously uh, chosen to depict him. That's a pretty extraordinary comparison here. Uh, in feminist terms. Moving from the religious to the secular sphere, we see that women of the Spanish nobility could uh, and did have an extraordinary amount of social, intellectual, and economic power. Perhaps, perhaps the most famous example of this is Doña Maria de Pilar Teresa Cayetana de Silva Alvarez de Toledo, and a lot else, 13th Duchess of Alba, known to all from the portraits of Goya. The Duchess of Alba and her great rival, the Duchess of Osuna, were patrons of the arts, literature, and music. Both the Osunas and the Albas championed the works of Haydn in Spain, and the Duchess of Osuna was the center of a group of intellectuals, here she is on the right, seeking to reform Spanish society and education. The Duchess of Alba had uh, 28 titles, at least nine times a grandee of Spain. I won't read them all, we're out of time. Actually, this conjoining of titles in the great noble families was a direct result of the women's ability to inherit titles and estates in the absence of male siblings. If pride and prejudice had been set in Spain, there would have been no economic motive for the plot because the Bennett sisters would simply have inherited the estate and even the younger ones would have been protected by law to have a percentage of the free goods and money of their parents. They would have sent their pompous cousin packing. In the case of the Alba Medina Sidonia joint estates, the Duke's mother, the Marquesa of Villafranca and Gonzaga, oversaw the financial administration of the combined family holdings, another example of feminist culture at the time. So whether secular or religious, women could and did play important roles in society. This is not our stereotype of Hispanic culture, but it ought to be, and it has become social reality to a very great extent in our time. And as I've said, this is matched by many other elements affecting all classes and types. From any point of view, the values of the Hispanic tradition, including the sometimes surprising progressive social consciousness, offer many things worthy of imitation and study. Thank you.